Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV. Joining me today is Stephen Harding to talk about his book, Escape from Paris. Links to buy it uh, in the description below, as they always are. Stephen has authored several books, uh, bestsellers, in fact, and was the editor-in-chief of Military History magazine. And uh, I will bring him in now. So good afternoon, Steve. How are you today? Fine, Paul. How are you doing? I'm very well. So writer and editor, uh, which is interesting because obviously edit, as an editor, things come to you. And as a writer, you're looking for projects to, to write about and you have to sift through lots of stories and to decide what makes a good one and, and what will work and what won't work. And how did this story that we're going to talk about uh, today come to come across your desk? Uh, well, I had finished a, a book. Um, my, my specialty is World War II stories that take a small group of people and try and illuminate a larger question about the war. And I was, uh, I'd finished the book and I was looking for something else to do. Uh, and I, I had three different threads I was trying to follow. I wanted to do a, an 8th Air Force story because I've always been about B-17s and the 8th Air Force. Um, I wanted to do a French resistance story. Uh, because I, I think it's a fascinating topic. And I wanted to somehow deal with women in in the war, either in the military or in the resistance. And I had been reading a bunch of stuff because um, as, as you know, when you know when you when you write, you really have to read. I mean, that's the basis of being a writer. Is you have to be able to read. And I came across literally a footnote in a uh, in a large volume about the Eighth Air Force about this young, um, gunner on a b-17 who was shot down uh, over paris and it became a um, sort of non-traditional pow well not pow but escape story mm -hmm. and in the process of researching i found out that it, it fit the bill it talked about the eighth air force it talked about the french resistance and it has women in it well brilliant and we'll get into the story in a minute and, and as i was saying to you before we went live there i think the, the ongoing theme this week week has been in, in terms of aviators is that that compared to perhaps infantrymen, compared to perhaps other aspects, some people in the Navy are doing a very um, menial but very, very important job. Aviators, lots and lots to concentrate on, lots of lots of mathematics, lots of instruments, lots of things, whatever your role is. And you, you, that's the way you get through the dangers by focusing on that precision job you've got to do. I mean, that would apply, of course, across the board to other services. But and then suddenly when an aircraft gets shot down, there you are outside of that world where you were competent and you were focusing on doing your job and you're in a completely different environment. And I think that 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 pressure, the psychological pressure of what happens, to these young young men. Um, when they're thrust from one situation that they are semi in control of to a situation where they are effectively helpless has been the recurring theme. So you've come armed with a PowerPoint, which I'll bring up and you're controlling. Um, a guy named Joe, good, good title for it there. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Stephen. Folks, we will do questions as we go along. There aren't many slides. It's a, it's a good story, but not, not too many to get bogged down with. So just throw your questions in the sidebar and I'll put them up and give them to Steve as we go along. But basically, I'm going to hand it over to my guest. Well, thanks, Paul. So uh, the gentleman we're going to be talking about is uh, a guy named Joe, Joe Cornwall. Um, on the screen, he is the um, second from my left, this fine looking gentleman. He was born in the state of Washington and had actually gone into the U.S. Army Air Corps, as it was known at that time, before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Now, Joe had, uh, had grown up in the farmland of, of eastern Washington, and one of the things that he grew up doing was what we call wing shooting, shooting uh, dove and other birds to eat and, and for sport. And he developed something that was going to be really important to him when the war started, and that was eye-hand coordination, right. being able to follow something moving with his eye and lead it enough with the shotgun to hit it. So when uh, after the Japanese um, attacked Pearl Harbor and the United States entered the, the Second World War, Joe decided that he wanted to, um, he'd been just uh, a staff enlisted guy at, a, at an airfield in Washington, and he volunteered to go to gunnery school. And he did. He went to Lowry Air Force Base in Colorado and a few other places. And he learned to be called, uh, learned to be what's called a flexible gunner. Now, a lot, a lot of you will know in B-17s uh, and in most of the other large bombers of World War II, you had turret guns, the top turret, the ball turret, uh, the nose turret in B-24s, for example. Those were power turret gunners, flexible gunners with a guy like Joe, who he was a, 
uh, an armorer, but he was also the left waist gunner on B-17s, meaning his gun was was flexible. Um, I've flown in a couple of B-17s over the course of my life, and I can just barely stand up when the airplane's moving. So how somebody um, could aim at an incoming you know, uh, 109 or an FW and actually hit it uh, has always kind of amazed me. So this is Joe when he was going to school. He uh, was ultimately assigned to the 94th Bomb Group. Now, when Joe was training, he was just trained to be a flexible gunner. He could have gone to B-24s, B-17s, B-25s, uh, any kind of American uh, bombardment aircraft that had a flexible gun. He joined up with his crew. Uh, it was like a, literally a cattle call. All of these various specialties, the pilots, the navigators, the bombardiers, the gunners, um, all came from their different schools and came together at a base in Utah, which was an assignment center. And it was kind of like a, a, a blind date. People were just chosen. You're a gunner. You're going here. You go here. So he joined a crew uh, led by a young lieutenant named Ed Purdy. And in the upper uh, right-hand corner, as I'm looking at it, he is the man that is kneeling uh, without the sunglasses. He's the officer and wearing the officer's cap. And Joe Cornwall is directly behind and above him wearing sunglasses. Right. So the 94th Bomb Group uh, was a B-17 group that was stood up to specifically join the 8th Air Force uh, in the UK. The interesting thing was uh, Ed Purdy and his co-pilot had both actually been trained as B-24 pilots. So when they showed up in Salt Lake City and suddenly they had this crew, they literally had to transition into the B-17 uh, kind of on, on, the, on the fly, <laughs> no pun intended. So uh, the 94th Bomb Group uh, essentially moved to the UK. They uh, first flew from one base, but they ultimately moved to Ruffham, uh, which is outside Bury St. Edmunds. I'm sorry, Bury St. Edmunds, I was told to say, not Bury. Uh, this, yep. the, um, it's a great, great site. Ruffham still has the original World War II uh, control tower, which you see in this image. And they've done a tremendous job about sort of keeping it in in the world war ii period it's it's a museum but it's also just a, a great building in its own right so on I the map, say, Steve, uh, that uh, Ruffham is a place very close to my heart my my, my, my mom is from Sudbury, so just down the road from yeah. various Evans. i spent a lot of time at Ruffham. i was actually at Ruffham airfield at an event the day princess anna died bizarrely which is one of those that you know when where were you when that happened thing i was there when the news of that broke or the day after the news broke so yeah, rough on that country. As soon as that control tower photo came up, I had pangs of nostalgia for many a weekend spent there. It was, um, it's an amazing base, and the owner of the land then had these event, great events. And I went years ago. I'm going down a rabbit hole, so I've said rabbit hole early, folks. You can have a drink. Uh, the owner of the land took me all through the maze of little tracks about where the bomb dump was, mm -hmm. and which was all overgrown. I have no idea what it's like these days, but it's, we're talking 25 years ago now, and. I'd grown up near all the 8th Air Force bases, and all of them had a little bit of something left. There was very few that had nothing. Some had some perimeter tracks, some had the control tower, some had bits and pieces of other things. But Ruffham actually had quite a lot of uh, various things, and uh, the, the, the bomb dump area was was amazing. And um, so, yeah, I'm just, I just add that personal background there that Ruffham is a place really close to my heart. So um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be listening even more intently now. <laughs> yeah, I commend it to anybody who who has the chance. It's a, it's a really great uh, place to spend a day and just, you know, really kind of live a little bit of, of the U.S. 8th Air Force experience in Britain. Uh, on the map, there's a, uh, up on the uh, sort of right corner, that's Ruffham Airfield. Yeah. And obviously the English Channel and the west coast of France. Um, the 94th, like most of the uh, 8th Air Force bomb groups, um, when they arrived in, in uh, 43, the um, strategic bombing campaign, which I know you guys have uh, talked about, was really starting to gear up. They moved beyond the, the little pinprick raids, and they were actually starting to hit uh, important targets inland. Um, and uh, the 94th played an increasingly large role in, in that effort. Um, the uh, when, when I talk to people um, about the 8th Air Force, uh, you get into some pretty esoteric concepts, one of which uh, is the staggered box formation, 
which sounds really boring, but it's what allowed um, daylight strategic bombing from the American point of view to actually work because you had mass bombers in certain formations that not only spread the bomb pattern over the target, but it allowed for interlocking defense uh, among the bombers. Now, uh, Joe Cornwall and his and his crew got pretty badly shot up on one of their earlier um, uh, missions. And the, the first name they put on their airplane was Naturals uh, because they had a, an image of, uh, of a pair of dice being rolled. And a natural in, in craps, which is what the dice game is called, is a 7-Eleven. So it had a 7-Eleven, which was a Naturals. And that's, you know, these are all 18, 19 year old guys. They thought that was pretty, uh, pretty amazing. That plane got shot up, so they went to a second aircraft that um, they named, uh, renamed eventually Salty's Naturals. And the Salty was actually the, uh, the Saltzman was the, the last name of, of their squadron commander whom they admired tremendously. Now, I want to uh, sort of call your uh, attention to the picture of the four uh, gentlemen up in the corner. Uh, the guy on the far left with the overseas cap on, that's Ed Purdy. The guy next to him is uh, his co-pilot. The guy next to him is uh, the navigator. Now, the interesting thing is the fourth man standing there uh, is not a member of their crew. Um, <laughs> he, um, this guy has a very interesting history. He's a World War I veteran of the U.S. Army. He stayed in France um, after the the war and became actually incredibly wealthy. He's the one who opened the uh, Hippodrome in Paris. He uh, promoted uh, boxing matches. His name was Jefferson Davis Dixon. And yes, he was from the American South and apparently had an accent that was thick enough to cut. But he was a millionaire uh, several times over. And when the United States entered World War II after the bombing of uh, Pearl Harbor, Jeff was in the United States and he immediately went and enlisted in the army again. Now, at this point, he's a fairly old man by their standards, you know, mid to late 40s and a millionaire. And um, he was given the, the job of being one of the uh, photographers who was supposed to document the uh, aerial campaign of the 8th Air Force. So a lot of the black and white uh, imagery that you've seen, um, some of it was shot uh, by Jeff Dixon. And of course, by Clark Gable and, and his people. So the picture of the four of them was taken on um, the day before, this was taken July 13th in 1943, which was the day before the 94th bomb group was uh, assigned to attack Le Bourget Airport just outside Paris. Mm -hmm. And to those of you who speak French, I apologize profusely. I don't speak French. Um, I had the... Um, I made the decision for reasons I don't understand to learn to speak German, which has come in handy on occasions, but um, not always. So the uh, attack on Le Bourget, which had been a, one of Paris's civilian airports and where Charles Lindbergh landed after his uh, mm. transatlantic flight, was a, a Luftwaffe uh, fighter base, but it was also a maintenance base. And so the 94th and a, another group were assigned to... Um, essentially bomb it back into the Stone Age. And one of the things that they ran into, which uh, is fairly important, is uh, the picture below the four gentlemen is the 94th Bomb Group attacking Le Bourget. It's one of the only pictures I have ever been able to find. That is not Joe Cornwall's aircraft, but it is of the um, 94th uh, Bomb Group. So what they ran into that day was essentially a buzzsaw. The Luftwaffe um, tracked them on the way in. They were they were escorted across the channel by um, RAF Spitfires. But as as we all have heard, the Spitfires had fairly short legs. They essentially had to to leave uh, because of fuel concerns and go back to the UK, which left the 94th and this this other group uh, on their own. Now that doesn't mean they were defenseless because as you know. B-17s at this time carried anywhere from 10 to 14 uh, 50 caliber machine guns. Um, a lot of them, uh, as you'll see in the, the wreck on the other side of this image, um, they put in their own field expedient nose guns. This was before the advent of the Chin turret and the B-17G. 
And this was to um, counteract a German tactic that proved to be um, incredibly um, uh, effective against American heavy bombers. And that was the 12 o'clock high attack. Um, we've all read about 12 o'clock high, but what it essentially meant was German fighters would race as far as they could ahead of the formation and turn and come in either from slightly above or level to the bomb group that they were attacking. And what this means is you've got, you know, a B-17 and, you know, an FW or whatever approaching each other at a combined speed of almost 500 miles an hour. And the FW or the 109 or whoever it is, is firing specifically at the cockpit and nose area of the B-17. The obvious uh, intent is to kill the pilots or at least, you know, knock out uh, their ability to control the aircraft. So uh, on the day that Joe Cornwall and his crews um, or his crew in the 331st uh, Bomb Squadron of the 94th, they were um, on the uh, approach to Le Bourget when they were hit by multiple fighters and uh, an aircraft ahead of Joe's, which was uh, one of the crewmen was a guy named Harry Eastman, who was actually a very good friend of Joe's. They lived in the same barrack at Ruffham, uh, just flew in different planes. Uh, Eastman managed to hit an incoming, probably FW, uh, that was coming into his part of the formation. The German aircraft essentially disintegrated and a big chunk of it hit Joe's aircraft. It took off the entire left wing outboard of the outboard engine. And um, years ago when I was researching this, I, I went flying into B-17 and I asked the pilot who, uh, interestingly enough, was about 35 and it was a, an airline pilot. Um, I said, what, what would you do if you lost the entire outboard part of your left wing? And he said, I'd hold a stable as long as I could to let the crew get out. And then I would pray all the way down because you're not going to survive it. And uh, Salty's Naturals, which was the name of Joe's airplane, did not survive it. Nor did most of the people ab aboard the aircraft. Only three people got out. Uh, Joe was one of them. The tail gunner, a guy named Templeton, got out. And the um, top turret gunner got out. Unfortunately, the top turret gunner had a parachute malfunction and he died. Mm. Uh, the rest of the aircraft went um, augering into the ground and uh, exploded. And then we come to the part, Paul, you were talking about where Joe Cornwall, the you know flexible gunner, very good at what he did, very competent guy, suddenly finds himself uh, more than 10,000 feet up in the air, which is you know, where oxygen gets a little rare. Yeah, that's high. Yeah. And, He's uh, when, when his plane, when he bailed out of it, he was probably somewhere around 22 to 23,000 feet. So he did what he had been told to do, which was don't pull your ripcord until you think you're around 10,000 feet. And I always wondered, how would you know that? You know, I mean, there's no altimeter on your, uh, you know, they use the, uh, the chest pack parachutes. So he fell until he thought he was below 10,000 feet. And then he pulled the ripcord. And from that point on, he was in a situation that he had never practiced before, because at that time, the vast majority of U.S. 8th Air Force crewmen had never been in a parachute. Mm. They might have put on the harness. They might have uh, been in some kind of simulator, but they had never jumped with a parachute. Um, the Most of them had never been shot down before or had to escape from an aircraft. So when Joe and, and uh, the tail gunner bailed out, they were in a whole new world. Now imagine jumping out of an airplane at 22,000 feet, tumbling end over end over end over end, trying to figure out when you're below 10,000 feet so you can breathe the oxygen. And just, just to jump in quickly, Holly Harris on, on Tuesday said that the group her uh, relative was in were told to know you're at the right altitude. You've got to be able to tell the difference between horses and cows on the ground. <laughs> uh, whether that transferred across the whole eight Air Force and whether that's been put to the test. And of course, it only works if you can see fields of animals that are either horses or cows. I mean, if you're right. ever a city, if you're ever a railway, but that was, it was interesting that Holly said that that was something that they've been told, don't pull the cord till you can tell the difference between horses and cows. So 
There we are. Uh, that was one of one of the measuring devices for for uh, estimating distance. I, I think that would be a very uh, a, a very good way to tell if you could focus long enough, because you're also supposed to be trying yeah. to get your feet, you know, below you so that you can, you know, uh, try and judge your distance. I mean, there's so many things going on. Plus, you're panic stricken. You've just bailed out of a yeah. disintegrating airplane. You are over enemy occupied territory. There is still an air battle going on all around you. There's, you know, maybe flak fighters, you know, all kinds of things. So Joe, like uh, the majority of, uh, you know, bomber crewmen that jumped out, had basically just been told, if you can, try to make it to a big city. Now you think about that. It's like, why would you want to do that? It would seem there'd be more chance of running into the Gestapo, and yet it was pretty much the opposite because. Most of these guys, young American guys, uh, especially at that time, they didn't speak French. Uh, mm-hmm. A lot of them didn't, um, you know, <laughs> didn't speak anything but English. So they were going to stand like a sore, stand out like a sore thumb. When they hit the ground, they were in flag cover, uh, coveralls. They've got the what's left of their harness. So Joe did what what they were told to do was he got rid of his stuff and tried to lay low, figure out where he was. Um, and eventually he was uh, put in touch with a French resistance cell. And the reason they wanted to take them to Paris was, number one, the American airmen wouldn't be so obvious as they might be in a small French village. Yep. And number two is because Paris was was a hub of um, the evader networks. Um, Joe was never a prisoner of war. He was never captured by the Germans. So he was technically obviously not a POW. He was what uh, I'm sure you've heard um, the term, he was an evader. Yeah. And the whole idea was the French uh, resistance worked um, to get allied airmen, uh, and for that matter, sailors, if they washed ashore or, or you know uh, anyone else, back to the UK. And in Joe's case, he ended up being taken to Paris. Now, this beautiful building you're, you're seeing here is the Hotel des Invalides, Um, which is one of the major landmarks of of Paris, built in the 17th century uh, by, I believe it was Louis XVI. I'm not a French historian. If in Uh, doubt, it's bound to be a Louis. Yeah. (laughs) And he built it essentially as a hospital and refuge for his soldiers. And it grew over time. And and by uh, by the time of World War II, in 1943 specifically, um, it, it... not only was it, um, you know, a a place for French veterans to live and recuperate, it also houses uh, and still does the tomb of Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, Right at the bottom of that huge dome, there's this big ornate place, which I'm sure many of you have seen, and it's really amazing. Uh, And that part of the the, um, campus was still open. I mean, it was still open for tourists, most of whom were German. But it was also a German uh, garrison um, because there were barracks back. I mean, this is a huge, covers many, many acres. Um, so there was a, a German unit. It was mainly um, headquarter types of people, you know, logisticians and cooks and bakers and whatever. But uh, the delightful family you see uh, next to it, uh, the tall, slender gentleman is Georges Morin. And his wife, Denise, is dressed in black. And the young woman in white is their daughter, Yvette. Now, they were what they called, they called themselves um, the uh, keepers of the tomb. They were uh, in charge of um, the keys that opened every door in the entire Envelide complex. Denise uh, was the one who let in uh, people who worked on, uh, you know, keeping up the art, repairing damage or whatever. Georges worked for a French agency um, that was also headquartered there that uh, watched. It was essentially the the French version of the American Veterans Administration. It saw to veterans needs, their their health care and whatever. They were allowed to live on the grounds. They had a, a small but quite nice apartment off to to one side. What um, George's uh, French colleagues, and of course the Germans didn't know, is that he and Denise were members of a French resistance organization Mm. called Term of Vengeance. Um, They had started out just after the 1940 fall of Paris and France. 
by hiding young Frenchmen who were trying to um, uh, escape being sent to Germany as, as laborers, uh, refractures, they were called. So they would hide these young people on the grounds of Envelide, which you would think, well, there are German troops everywhere. There, there are tourists coming and going, and, and that's true. But there are also more than a thousand individual rooms just in the main part of this complex. Wow. And Denise, uh, the delightful lady in the black dress, had the keys literally to every room. And so they um, started hiding people, various parts of the complex, until they could be gotten away. So ultimately, Joe Cornwall ended up being um, sort of shuttled by various means into Paris, and he was put uh, under the charge of the Marin family. Now, the majority of uh, Allied airmen uh, who were shot down and who were gotten out of occupied France, excuse me, were only in France for maybe two weeks. The idea was to get them out of the city, out of Paris as fast as they could. That usually meant getting them uh, to the Spanish border and essentially making them walk over the Pyrenees into allegedly neutral Spain and then hopefully get them back to the UK from there. Um, as it turned out, Joe spent a little bit more time uh, there because he actually fell in love with Yvette and she with him. Um, now, at this point, uh, Joe's 28 and Yvette was 22. Um, these pictures were actually taken atop the um, main part of Envelide. The color picture I took when my wife and I were there, and it's it's a great, uh, great place to view all of Paris. You see the Eiffel Tower in the background. Yeah. What you don't see is a 40 mile an hour wind blowing through this little... Um, space here. So the black and white pictures were taken about 10 feet behind where I was standing when I took this picture. And you'd think, okay, that's not really bright standing up on top of the building, sort of advertising that you're there. Well, if you are on in this little area, you can't be seen from the ground. It's just, it's too high up. It's a hundred and some odd feet. And also any German that saw you being German would assume that you were supposed to be up there. Yeah. Um, and uh, getting up there is, is delightful. I wish I could show you the pictures coming up the, you know, 400 year old all wooden staircase. Um, I've, I've been up enough church towers in Normandy to know that you feel like you're Indiana Jones at various points because they get more rickety and more now. And you think is, is this, is this some poor French guy having a laugh at my expense, sending me exactly. up these and there's <laughs> pigeon shit everywhere and stuff in my experience. Yeah. It's an ordeal. If I, if I may stay before you can, can I, can I backpedal you a little bit to the, to the, mm -hmm. to the, the period of the middle of the 43 and, and the difference, if you're an eighth air, air crewman about flying over, Germany and flying over an occupied country like France, because if you get shot down in Germany, you absolutely know that pretty much everybody on the ground there is your enemy and 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 doesn't want you know. And later on, with the terror flyers, might be. But in in someone like France or Norway or Denmark or Belgium, you're going into an environment where the first person you meet could be on your side. They might pretend to be on your side. They might be an enemy. Do we know what kind of information if any air crews were given about how far to trust and if someone said we'll do this with you or shouldn't do or they kind of follow their instinct is there is there anything you found about documentation about what the standard set of advice was for people flying over somewhere like france yeah they i mean uh, all these air crew had escape and evasion briefings e and e briefings uh, briefings and they were uh, told for example you know if you're shot down in this particular region you're likely to run in to um members of the communist resistance who may not uh, be all that friendly with the resistance group down the road, because as we know, the French resistance was not monolithic. It was made up of everybody and his brother and sister-in-law, and they all had different political beliefs. Some collaborated with the Germans. Many obviously did not. So um, in the briefing that you would get as a, as a young uh, airman, you would be told, okay, you have a, a pouch with a certain amount of, uh, French money in it, francs. Um, you have a uh, an escape map, which um, was used usually on silk, 
that would show you basically the area that you're operating in. But these are not, you know, um, hikers maps. It's, it's like, here's France, you know, figure out where you are. So they were told that when you hit the ground, first of all, get rid of as much of your obvious equipment as you can. Your parachute harness, you know, um, if you're wearing something else under your flight suit, try and wear that. But all of these guys came down wearing U.S. Army issue aviators boots, which were kind of a dead giveaway. Yeah. So uh, in Joe's case, he did what everybody else did. He uh, when he initially landed, he stayed sort of stationary until he got an idea of where he was because his aircraft actually went down before uh, dropping its bombs on Le Bourget. So he had a, a basic idea of where they were, um, but it, it really, you know, as you were saying, Paul, you, you didn't know the sympathies of the people you ran into. And because Joe did not speak French, like most of these young uh, aviators, it was all sort of pantomime and, hey, I'm an American, and, and do you wave money at them? <laughs> yeah. that might be a, a smart move. And in Joe's case, as with many aviators, he just happened to get lucky and be um, and hook up with the right people. And that's how he was then put on the sort of uh, progressive movement into Paris. Brilliant. Thanks very much. That was a great answer. <clears throat> so um, Joe and Yvette uh, really hit it off. I mean, which is, again, amazing because Yvette only spoke a few words of English. And Joe, by the you know, by this time didn't know more than a few words of, of French. Uh, fortunately, Georges uh, kept in the house a small French-English dictionary. Now, most of the time, um, Joe and um, his, his friend Harry, who was also there with him, would sleep in the downstairs part of the Morenz apartment or upstairs if they thought the, the Germans were being active. But they were interacting with his family all day long. And um, Harry, the, the guy that you see, the, the bald gentleman in the lower picture, he was considered an old man because he was 34, and which was pretty old for, for a bomber crewman in World War II, at least in the uh, U.S. Army Air Forces. But because he was bald, he and um, the uh, one of the two brunette women, uh, the one wearing the black skirt, she, was, uh, she knew that they were American evaders, and she and Harry were able to walk literally all around Paris. Because nobody, none of the Germans would think, well, you know, this bald guy can't be an American, you know, aviator. So they they knew what was going on. Um, and again, you know, every day, Envalide was packed with tourists, many yeah. of them uh, German, because the German military had a, a saying, jeder um, einmal in Paris, everyone in Paris once. So they were bringing German troops from all over their occupied France to see Paris. And they all wanted to see Napoleon's tomb. And so you've got all these Germans circulating 100 feet below you, and you're sitting up on the roof enjoying a bottle of wine and a very nice French woman who wants to talk with you. So as it happened, they, uh, they fell in love, as uh, often happens, and uh, spent a lot of time up here on the roof, despite the, the wind. And I will tell you, if you're not ready for it, and you get caught by that wind, there are no railings up there. And you're looking mm -hmm. at a 130 foot drop to the bottom. So you have to be a little bit careful. So as I mentioned earlier, the um, the typical time that that a, an allied evader would be on the, the ground in occupied France was a 10 days, two weeks. They wanted to get them out as quickly as they could. And uh, the French resistance kept setting up ways for Joe to get out of France that didn't work out. Um, one time he was, uh, they were gonna put him and um, Harry on a train to try and get them as close to the Spanish border as they could. And yet the Gestapo was in the train station, so they had to abort it. And, and truth be told, uh, Joe had no great desire to leave Paris at that point because ultimately he, he and Yvette went to her parents and said, look, this is not your basic wartime romance we want to get married. And so they went to the local uh, parish priest because they're Roman Catholic. And he essentially blessed their engagement. And the idea was 
that of course Joe would go back and and continue the war effort. But when the war ended, he would come back and rejoin Yvette and they would be married and live happily ever after in Paris. That didn't work out because um, ultimately the uh, the French resistance said, look, we're, for some reason we can't get this guy anywhere near the Spanish border. So they did something that was very unusual. And, and bear, bear in mind, uh, at this point, um, Joe was a, a sergeant. He was not an officer. He didn't have any special knowledge. But they decided the only way to get him out would be to fly him out. So the Lysander that you see there um, was from the 161st Special Operations Squadron. And their whole uh, mission during the war was to carry people into and out of occupied territory covertly. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever been in a Lysander. I've been to the one at the Shuttleworth Collection. Yeah, I've seen it. Not been in it. Yeah. I just barely fit in the back seat myself. And they would often carry two or three people in the back seat. Um, and, and you can just barely see in this photograph, there was a welded ladder down the side of the fuselage. And the, the Lysander would fly in in the middle of the, the night to an airfield that was marked by the French resistance with candles and tin cans, land, literally dump people off, take anybody who was coming out aboard and try and be on the ground no more than, uh, you know, three minutes, four minutes. Um, and interestingly enough, Brad Pitt, one of his recent movies, he did that in the Lysander. Yeah. But, um, so Joe was finally told, okay, this time you are really going. So he did yet a, another you know, tearful farewell from uh, the Marin family, was taken out to a field some distance outside Paris and flown back to the UK. So at this point, um, the Marin family is, um, has successfully gotten not only Joe, but a lot of other people moved on. But they didn't know at this point that they also had a traitor in their group. Um, and in fact, it was two brothers who betrayed them to the Gestapo. So not long after Joe had flown away back to the UK, um, Gestapo troops kicked open the door of the Marin's apartment and uh, took them all into custody. And that began a uh, sort of a nightmarish time for uh, Denise and George and their daughter. Um, George was sent directly to uh, Buchenwald, the concentration camp in Buchenwald. Um, Denise and Yvette were sent to um, the predominantly women's camp at Ravensbrück. Mm -hmm. And that is a, a whole part of the uh, story that um, w was difficult for me to um, research. I'd, I'd lived in Germany for five years. I'd uh, spent time at some of the various camps, but I'd become invested in, in this family who, you know, uh, I never met the parents. Uh, my wife and I were lucky enough when we were searching this book to meet Yvette uh, in France. And I will mention that in a minute. So the Moran family has gone into the concentration camp system. Joe gets back to his unit and is told that he's being sent back to the United States because the 8th Air Force uh, had a rule at that point that if you had been shot down over occupied France, and if you had evaded, you could never fly combat again in the same yeah. area so that if you were shot down, you couldn't tell everybody. So he was sent back to the United States um, where he uh, started training other gunners. And it looked as if eventually he was going to be assigned to uh, a B-29 group in the, the Pacific, although that didn't actually happen um, because the, the war wound, wound down. Now, he and Yvette, um, their only communication after Joe left Paris was Yvette wrote Joe a, a fairly innocuous letter. You have to read between the lines about what this letter said. And, and I'll tell you about that in just one second. So um, Joe uh, is the fine looking gentleman on the left. He's wearing his uh, gunner's wings. This was actually taken... Um, the day that he got out of the Army Air Forces. And his first goal was to get back to Paris and marry Yvette. Yvette is um, 
you see the U.S. Air Force officer, Yvette, is the younger woman just to his uh, his right. That is Yvette. And this was taken uh, later, obviously, after the war, when Yvette was um, given the Croix de Guerre and, and various other honors. The reason that, um, and I have to, this is a spoiler, if you intend to read the book, uh, Joe and Yvette never saw each other again after he left Paris because they were trying to communicate but uh he was only in the uk for a little while before he was sent back to the united states so he didn't get this letter that she wrote for quite some mm. time and when he was finally able to write back to her he said i want to come back and marry you and she said of course i want to marry you but um by this time they'd found out that george had died in buchenwald um in christmas of 1944 and Denise, the mother, was in, and that's the delightful gray-haired lady in the other picture. Yep. She, she had come back from the camps very, very ill. And so um, Yvette did something um, selfless. She gave up a life with Joe to take care of her mother and um, and wait on the mm -hmm. off chance that maybe the, the father had not really died and might show up. So the two of them, Joe and Yvette, um, went their separate ways and uh, never saw each other again. Now, flash forward to when I was researching this story, I found uh, Joe Cornwall after the war married a, a very nice woman who already had two sons. And he took them on as his uh, stepsons. And I found one of them living in Olympia, which is the capital of the state of Washington. And I contacted him and he said, oh, yeah, I've got a lot of Joe stuff. Um, uh, if you can come here to Olympia, I will show you anything you want, let you copy the photos and everything else. So I was in San Francisco on business and I flew up to Washington for the day and I rented a car and I drove out there. And, and he, he, he was absolutely correct. He had all kinds of stuff, pictures and everything else. But he also had a, a beat up old black wallet. And I said, was this Joe's wallet? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah. He carried that. In fact, he had it on him when he died in the 70s. And I said, do you mind if I just take a look through it? And, and the stepson said, no, go right ahead. So I started looking through it. And, of course, there's his driver's license and all kinds of things. But tucked in a little hidden pocket in the back of this wallet, I found this very well-folded but obviously old piece of paper. And I pulled it out. And it's the letter that Yvette wrote to him the few days after he left Paris. When he finally got it, he carried it for the rest of his life and was carrying it on the day that he died. So the other thing I managed to do, which I, uh, um, I owe to a, an excellent researcher in France, she found Yvette, who by the time uh, my wife and I met her uh, at her beautiful farm in uh, Angoulême, uh, Yvette at that point was 95 or 6. Um, just delightful, delightful woman. She, she, you know, we, we took the train from Paris, got to her house. She had cooked an entire French lunch with champagne to start. And I, I, you know, I, again, I don't speak French. My wife is fluent in French and Italian. They were having a great time. I was trying to ask serious questions. They're laughing together. It turned out to be a great day. Um, and sadly, uh, she died on her 100th birthday um, in 2022. No, I'm sorry, Christmas Day of 2021. It was her uh, 100th birthday, or just after. Wow. And just so you know, your researcher, Ellen Hampton, is watching right now and commenting in the sidebar. So uh, <laughs> that's so uh, small world. Ellen's been on the show before a couple of times. So yeah, I, I, as soon as you said that, I thought, I bet it's Ellen. Ellen's watching. She, yeah, it so. is. And, and I will I will tell you all, Ellen is just a wonderful human being, a good friend of ours, and a dynamite researcher. Because any of you who've ever tried to research the French archives, that's a whole separate specialized skill set. Oh, God, yes. Uh, the language helps, but it's just, uh, it's like entering a, a sort of some Greek mythology la labyrinth of riddles. And yeah, no, it's, um, it's yeah, uh, lots and, of and, great stuff there, but how and, and, how they file stuff it can be can be quite confusing. <laughs> yeah, and how they find, find where they file it. And, and Ellen was great because, you know, she not only knew the, the archive, she knew the city. My, my wife was 
uh, quite familiar with Paris. I, when I lived in Germany, I visited Paris a couple of times, but no more than tourist sorts of things. Uh, and it was through Ellen that we got this really, really, really rare opportunity to climb all over the Hotel des Anglis, uh, which was amazing. So, um, yeah, so that is really the larger sort of overall story um, of Escape from Paris. There's there's so much going on here, Paul, as, as I know your, your watchers and, and your uh, other guests have talked about. The whole idea of being thrust from what you know, which is already a dangerous situation, into a completely new environment that you don't know anything about, you don't speak the language, and people are trying to catch you. Um, that's why, you know, escape stories make such great films. Um, and I, I've always hoped that, uh, that Escape from Paris would make a film. Um, I have two other of my books, which are still in the ongoing process of being made into films, which is a uh, incredibly frustrating process. Yep, been that. Jo- yep, I know. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, that that's uh, generally the story. And um, if if anyone has questions, I'd I'd be able to uh, happy to be answering them as best I can. No, well, definitely. And my first comment is is that it would have been, of course, fantastic for the happy ending to be that they married and they had nineteen children and they moved around the world and they did some kind of fantastic humanitarian job. To but, but the reality is is that the war broke and destroyed as many relationships as it did create them. You know that 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 that. The, the what we have a romantic idea of the war and every, everything having a happy ending and everybody returning home and marriages carrying on but actually research shows that marriages struggled after war those that did reunite what relationships that were created in the middle of stress when the when peace came the situation was different they didn't they didn't prosper so so you know we, we see those images for example of the of the war brides going across mm-hmm. to, the, to the USA but a lot of them. There's a great song um, by one of my favorite bands from the, from the '80s, Squeeze, um, a, a, about a, a, an old lady living who was a war bride. Um, it's it's the the, the the kind of the country and western one Squeeze did, which is great. The lyrics are fantastic. Um, I just can't remember the name of the song right now. Someone in the sidebar will tell you which one it was. Letter Letter from Love or something. It's called. Cool. Mm-hmm. And the whole story is about a woman who went out and then became a lonely old person, and so. In a weird way, if if I didn't have, I mean, obviously you're invested in the story, and I don't know how much other it would have had. A, it would have been greater to have this happy ending. But actually, the, the ending that you've brought us is a more realistic ending for how the war um, damaged lives. It is, and 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 not just you know personal romantic relationships, but what happened in the Marin family happened to a lot of members of the French Resistance. Yeah. You know, they didn't come home to parades. They went to a concentration camp. George died miserably of various diseases you know his wife and his daughter took years literally years to get over it and you know the 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 thing that we talk about now as post-traumatic stress disorder was not something that a lot of service members were followed for after world war ii so people like joe came came home after flying god knows how many missions over you know occupied europe and all of the trauma and stress and everything else, and they shoved it down inside my father was a world war ii veteran my wife's father all my uncles and other than a, a semi humorous story now and again you never heard about it because these guys primarily guys but also women um shoved a lot of this stuff down yeah. uh and it's it's unfortunate, but that, as you were saying, Paul, that's what led to the breakup of a lot of relationships. Yeah, because a guy had come home from three years of crazy hell, and and not be able to fit back in. Um, yeah, you know, it's still happening today with with not just you know uh, Afghan and Iraqi veterans, but think about all the guys that are fighting in Ukraine and what their lives are going to be like after this. So. Um, no, definitely, you're right there, and and the fact that the Gestapo broke this little network because, alas, that is often the case. I mean, the, it, we've done various shows about the um, the escapes from from Brittany and the MTBs that came and picked up people in the beach, the Pluha Beach, things like that. But yeah, you know, every time this subject comes up, we've talked about the uh, the, the 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 
um, Belgian to Paris network, there, there are these there are these traitors, there are these infiltrators, there are the Germans are putting agents in, you know, very few of these, any of these escape lines or networks survived the war without at least one devastating raid where the Germans got in at some point during the war, broke up the ring, broke up the network, people were deported, they were killed, they were murdered, they were imprisoned, and yet often out of the ashes of one ring or network, a new one would form and take the place. And yes, we know that the millions and millions of people that claim to be in the resistance in France and Norway and Belgium, that the actual number is, is lower than some of the post-war claims. But those that did do what do do what they did to help allies and help the the, 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 the dangers they were in and their families were in can never be forgotten and that the, the the cost of of families being taken away and deported and your, your next door neighbors being deported and, and, and rounded up as well it, it should always be said so um well an amazing story um steve I'm, uh, there's no more questions coming in right now i think you've people are going to read they're saying they're going to read the book anyway even, <laughs> even knowing, knowing the ending so um, anything else you want to say about the experience of, of completing this story and, and, and the fact that as other people who've been on my channel and told stories about people, the people you wrote about now no longer with us, as you said, uh, Yvette passed away some time ago. Um, where will these stories come from in the future? That that's the thing is everything will be next, next, of, next of kin, won't it? I suppose for, for research and editors that that connection with people who live through it is coming to an end. It, it, it is. Uh, one positive sign, though, Paul, is, you know, for example, the, the Official Secrets Act, uh, you know, they're going to start releasing more stuff as we approach the, you know, 100th anniversary of the end of the war. So, you know, we're, we're going to be losing that personal um, narrative of the people who are actually there and can tell you about it. But we're going to be getting a, a lot more of the, the records that we had not been able to see. And, yeah. and as a as a military historian, I mean, I, I helped do the, the history of the American invasion of Grenada years ago and things like that. The difficulty now for modern military historians is that there isn't that much paper. You know, in World War II, if there was a fight, you wrote an after action report. You had things being written almost as soon as the shooting stopped. Well, today, a lot of that stuff is done by encrypted cell phone. And mm -hmm. so there isn't a paper trail. So military historians going forward uh, we'll still have a better time trying to write World War II history than they may have trying to write the history of, of future conflicts. Um, That's a good point. Yeah, it's it's an interesting thing. And one one final thing: the reason I, I really um, found this to be an important story is because too many um, too many military historians talk about the big circles and arrows on the map. You know, the the red arrow coming this way and the blue arrow. War and and I spent a lot of time in conflict zones. War is very personal and it's not, you know, you rarely see the, the big muscle movements. You're, you're seeing exactly what you see in front of you. And when I wrote the book uh, about um, Castle Itter, I interviewed two American infantrymen who were no more than 10 feet apart during an important firefight. And their descriptions could have been at different wars. I mean, yeah. they, they were just so focused. So I, I think in closing, I would just say that... Um, I still think World War II is an important subject with a lot of stories to, to be mined and to be told. And I would encourage, you know, um, your, your watchers and, uh, and people who are interested to go out and find those stories. You know, you don't have to write a book. You don't have to write a screenplay. But, you know, these people gave a lot for all of us. And, and we're still living in a, in a world shaped by World War II. So yeah. Yeah, I think they're important stories to tell. No, definitely. And and, the, and I think the other bright spot on the horizon is that, and this is a generalization, but I think it applies. It's it's the, the veterans themselves and the, and the people who survived the war, partners, mothers, whatever, they weren't necessarily uh, the ones to talk about it because they got on with their lives. The sons and daughters and the next generation maybe have had the interest, but they weren't necessarily the ones who know how to scan documents and digitalize. It's the grandchildren, that generation, like we're finding in normally people coming now they're researching their grandfather. They're coming with all the the diaries scanned. They've got all the photos scanned. They've got the letters all scanned. They, you know, they're fl flipping through their tablets and their iPads, things like that, with all the information there. So, that that is the hope that the that the the younger people with a connection, even if it's two generations, it's a grandchildren or even great grandchildren, they will have the resources to put the information within the family together. They'll know how to go and use the internet to 
to contact historians, mm-hmm. to contact archives, to contact, you know, you made contact with Ellen, uh, Ellen with her work, made contact with other people. I've made contact with Ellen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so the, the hopes for, for bringing stories via the assistance of other people has never been easier. That, that I mean, when I, I, when I wrote to World War II veterans, I mean, just going to take a personal story for the viewers. I had my first copy of The Longest Day, which had a list of all the people who contributed to it by Cornelius Smyatt. And it would say, you know, David Smith from so-and-so Wyoming. So I would do it via my local library is I could order American telephone directories, the white page, and I would order that. And it would come a couple of weeks later and I would look through the person. And I would never go, I would never go with someone called Smith because it was possible. I would go for the weird, strangely spelt Polish name or some kind of, I think, okay, there's a chance of finding that one, you know. Mm-hmm. And then I would write letters. I would literally write four or five letters to different people. And it would take me maybe six months to make contact with the right person. And now, of course, online, yeah, you know, you call them. Remember the family? Is that on Facebook? Is it on Twitter? It messaged someone. Are oh, you by any chance related to so and so, so and so? And yeah, that's my great grandfather. And boom, connection done 15 seconds later. So there is a real hope for, um, for, for the, the connecting of the dots in the future. And and you're you're uh, Paul. You're infected with something that uh, a lot of us carry. It's it's a thing that I like to refer to as research rapture. I just love finding stuff out. And you yeah. you have to get to a point where you say, okay, I know enough to start writing about this now. And I, I'm sort of in the midst of this now with a book I'm working on. It's like, okay, I know enough. I need to move on. So. Yeah, no. So you, you've got to have. I always find you've got to have lots of projects open because some of them will will end up at dead end. Some of them will just get stuck at that point where you can't make that next bit. You can't get that lead. You can't find that. You go, okay, that one would be good, but it's just stuck there. But if you've got five or six on the go, kind of going, there's a fair chance that one of them will will come together and you'll make that connection. And I mean, I'm doing less of that kind of research work now, though. I've have started to commit to write this book on the Falaise Gap, which I'm going to do this winter. But anyway, yeah, it, it's true. other people I know who are now doing that. And they've got, it, it's hard, it, it can be easy to get a bit despondent when the connections aren't being made. But if you kind of have several oh, several options mm-hmm. open, one of them will come good and you'll make that contact. So, and as Norma Graham, one of our Canadian research rapture is a great term for it. I will start you. That's, yeah, that's, that's yours. I'll give you credit for that, Steve. That's a great <laughs> phrase. Well, uh, it's it's something that uh, I know a lot of people uh, are also infected with. So you know, um. it's it's the, the best is admitting you've got a problem and it's finding help with others who've got the same problem. I think that's we've 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 revealed something. We've got it off our chest. Now, Steve, it's been great talking to you. I can't wait to bring you uh, you back for another subject. Um, uh, you know, one of your World War Two subjects or something else you're working on because you deliver it well and people loved it. And I think they are going to go out and buy the book. So it's great. So. Folks, we'll be back again with another Steve tomorrow. Steve Snyder is going to tell us another story of another air crew that was shot down. That's a totally different experience. That'll be tomorrow. And, um, yeah, um, thank you very much for your questions and comments. And, uh, and as always, I'll see you tomorrow. So, Steve, thank you very much again. And, uh, I, yeah, it's, um, we'll, we'll make an excuse to talk to you again at some point in the future. Anytime, Paul. Thanks for having me. Cheers, then. Thanks, everybody. This is Paul Woodard for World War II TV saying see you again tomorrow. Bye, everybody.